Hi, welcome back to AstroArt. Uh, this program is produced by Astronomers Without Borders and uh, CosmoQuest. Today we have two wonderful guests. Uh, one is our uh, host, uh, Dr. Pamela Gay, who is kindly uh, sponsoring this program, and uh, our wonderful artist and uh, visual strategist for NASA, Dan Goods. Uh, a few words about uh, our guest, uh, Dan Good's passion is to give people experiences where they interact with something beautiful, meaningful and or possibly profound. He gets to do this as the vis visual strategist at NASA's JPL, where he creates ways of communicating the hour of space to the general public as well as on his own time through public and private art commissions around the world. He was named one of the most interesting people in Los Angeles this year by LA Weekly. So uh, Dan, I'm very happy to have you here tonight and uh, I'm really looking forward to hear more about the aerogel and all your interesting experiments <laughs> at uh, NASA. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, so um, uh, maybe what I'll do first is kind of give you a sense of where I'm at. So um, hopefully you can see, whoa, um, you can see the little uh, Google map there. And uh, I'm in Pasadena, California. And so just to kind of give you a sense of where that's at in the U.S., can I go in Let's see. and zoom all the way in. It's a uh, it's a big place. Uh, there's five thousand. Let's see why isn't this going exactly there? So we're at the foothills of um, the Los Angeles area. It's really beautiful right there. Uh, but uh, I think what I'll do right now is I'll just kind of give you a little background of how I got here because uh, it's kind of a funny story and people are usually pretty interested in, in that and then uh, I'll show you some projects and uh, we'll kind of go from there. So here we go. Yeah, so um, it's kind of funny because my uh, my path to JPL and to NASA is, is probably a little bit differently than most people. Um, I went to an art school and uh, there's a place uh, right next door. It's called Art Center College of Design and uh, I studied graphic design. And when I was there, there was um, a number of different uh, majors. There was graphic design, there was advertising, and what I loved about the advertising students is that they, they had really big, crazy ideas. Uh, they weren't very good designers, but they had big ideas and they were really conceptual about uh, what they were trying to uh, get across. And then there was graphic design students, which I was with, and, and a lot of them, you know, they're really great with uh, composition and color and that sort of thing, but when we do critiques, they rarely kind of talked about the actual uh, concept that they were trying to get across. And then there was uh, what was called environmental design students, and they're, they're not architects, but they deal with large spaces, they try to create uh, a unique environment, and a lot of times they use really interesting materials like ping pong balls or, you know, like if you took one ping pong ball and then you use like 10,000 of them in a space, it would really change the feeling of the space that you went into. So I became really fascinated with this world of environmental design, using materials and creating spaces, uh, the concepts that an ad student might have, advertising person might have, uh, but then also the, the beauty and composition of a graphic designer. And so I ended up um, getting a chance to have a, a class with this one particular professor. Uh, his name is Roland Young. And um, he, he uh, I wanted to do this project for this grocery store. There's a grocery store that sells 500 kinds of soda in their store. And they're all in, in bottles. And the bottle is sort of what makes, uh, makes it really good because they use sugar cane instead of um, uh, uh, corn syrup. And within a bottle, it just holds its taste a lot better than a can. Uh, 
And so uh, I started to do what a normal graphic designer would do, and I, I wanted to make a logo. And I struggled with it, struggled with it, and finally he told me, you know, you're just too practical. You need to stop being so practical because that puts you inside of a box. And he said, you need to just go play. And if you play enough, you're going to come up with really unusual things, and you're so practical that you'll take those unusual things and sort of come up with a practical use for them. And so I was a little nervous because uh, this was near the time that I was going to graduate from school, and, uh, but I thought I would do it anyways. And so, whoop, I'm pressing the wrong button there. So, um, you know, I started to play around making little sculptures and lighting them in different ways. You know, I thought when you backlight them, they look really pretty and thought, well, you know, what if uh, I put all these bottles on top of their building? That would be kind of interesting. You could light them and uh, have them glow at night. Um, and then I became really interested in the way that they, they make music. You know, when you blow on a bottle, it makes a little noise. And here in the States, uh, we have these ice cream trucks that drive around. And when the ice cream truck drives around, you hear music and it lets you know that they're about to come. And so I thought, wow, you know, what if, what if I could put these on top of my car and pretend that I was trying to make some, or actually try to make some music. I don't know if you can read it there, but it says, it looks cool, uh, but it didn't work. So that one didn't work. Uh, eventually, I got my friend and had him kind of push the bottles up and down, and, and that one didn't work either. Uh, but eventually, I got the right angle and the right distance, and it made this beautiful noise and it go woo 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 so here uh, in, in California especially we have lots of these taco truck stands and um, they, they drive around and, and they sell food from these and so I thought wouldn't it be cool to put a bunch of these bottles on a taco truck stand so that as it drove along it would make music and and thought that was a lot of fun and uh, then my friend has perfect pitch so she can go around to each bottle and there's 500 of them and uh, tell me what the note is for each one of these bottles. And so she made the scale, and I don't, I don't know anything about music, and, uh, but I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I made a pipe organ of some sort? And then you could give it to musicians, and they could play music with it, and then you could play that music in the store. And, and anyway, so it would be a lot of fun. And so this is sort of the way I do most of my projects, is that I really don't know how to do a lot of things, but I'm really good at asking questions and going around and, and trying to figure out how to get things done. And so I try to start off with a, a crazy idea, a fun idea, something that's meaningful that other people uh, want to be a part of, and then, then I go researching and trying to understand how things uh, can get accomplished. And what I found is that I have to know a lot about um, Oh, the basics of, of what can happen, because uh, a lot of times the people who are experts in areas, they'll, they'll say, oh, you can't do that, or you can't do this, but uh, if I know enough and I've done enough research, then I can tell them, no, no, I, I know you can do this. See, this is how you can do it, and, and that's a lot of times helpful in getting uh, unusual, complicated projects done. And uh, so it's kind of funny that this is what ended up getting me to the Jet Propulsion Lab. And the reason that happened was that uh, this is one of my last uh, uh, terms at, at, at school. And uh, right after that, I had an opportunity to spend a summer at the California Institute of Technology. And Caltech is what we call it. Caltech owns JPL. But at the time, I, just, uh, I was working with an artist who was coming up with new ways of visualizing lots of data. And I, I had a, a wonderful experience there, and, and I, I had my first experience working with scientists, and the uh, first time I'd ever seen an artist working with scientists. And so that really uh, made me think about what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And, and I thought, wow, you know, is, is there any way that I can work at a research center of some sort? And so I ended up getting a tour of JPL, and just to kind of give you a little sense of, of what JPL does, uh, there's a lot of different things that we do. We have uh, a bunch of instruments and satellites that are orbiting the Earth that study the oceans, the land, um, the, the atmosphere from space. Uh, we have other um, telescopes that are in space that are looking at stars and galaxies far, far away. And uh, I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with, with this by now, uh, the landing of Mars. Uh, we landed on Mars in uh, last August. And so... 
it's a big place. There's 5,000 people there doing a lot of really uh, amazing, amazing projects. But this is sort of the, uh, the way that people normally get to JPL. Is they're really good, they're really smart in a high school, and then they go to some really nice uh, undergraduate, and then they go to Caltech or MIT or some, you know, Oxford or something like that. Uh, but that wasn't, that wasn't the route that I ended up taking. Uh, I didn't do all that well in high school. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't because I wasn't smart, it was because I wasn't interested. Uh, there was just nothing that, that lit my fire that got me excited about something. And so I'm not exactly, if, if you're in the, in the States, we have the SATs and, and somehow I got myself out of all those things. Um, but then I went to this art school, art center, and I realized that, that my passion is to uh, come up with ways of, of giving people a moment where they have a sense of awe about the universe that we live in. And uh, so once, once I sort of found that, uh, I, I had this chance to have a tour with the director of JPL, and I talked to him for a couple of seconds, and I said, hey, you know, it'd be, wouldn't it be cool if you had artists working at JPL? And he said, uh, sure, that would be great. And then he walked away. And he's a person that is very hard to get a hold of. And uh, I ended up, uh, I'd been sending my resume in FedEx because uh, people don't throw away a FedEx. If you get a FedEx, you know, I, I don't know anyone who's gotten a FedEx and just thrown it away. And so uh, I was gone, and um, this is one of the uh, great little flukes that have happened in my, my life. My wife went down to mail this, and they didn't have any normal letter size envelopes. They only had gigantic envelopes. And so she sent it anyways. And so the director got this, this giant envelope uh, with only a little resume in it. And uh, he sent it on to some people, and uh, someone said, you know, uh, well, maybe you could do animations for us because we need animations of our spacecraft. And, and I said, uh, I'll do anything because this is an amazing place. But um, you know this bottle project that I have? You know, this is the sort of stuff that I'm really passionate about. And it was sort of a unique moment in my life because um, I just graduated from school. Uh, my wife and I had just had a baby. She had the baby. Um, she didn't have a job, I didn't have a job, we were running out of money, and uh, this was a moment where he could have just said, you know, that, that's great, uh, that battle project looks like fun, but we don't really need anyone like you around. But he didn't. Uh, he, he said, wow, this is really fascinating, and, and he saw, he really liked the stuff that I did at, at Caltech as well. And he said, well, you know, I, I don't exactly understand what you do, but uh, I'll give you six months, and we'll see what happens. And uh, it's been 10 years now. So it's, uh, it's turned out pretty well. And when I first got there, uh, one of the things that um, we were working on was, was coming up with ways of finding planets around other stars. And uh, I think with the, with the crowd that we have here, a lot of you guys know about planet finding. And they would talk about trying to find a, uh, an Earth-like planet around other stars. And they would uh, give me all these numbers about billions and, you know, hundreds of billions of this and that. And, and it was really hard for me to understand because, as you saw, math wasn't my, uh, my uh, forte. And so I really needed something to experience. And so what I did is I, I made this uh, installation using sand. So if a sand, grain of sand represented a single galaxy, you would need six rooms full of sand to show all the galaxies that, that we know about. And what I do is I have this little magnifying glass. And under the, underneath of that magnifying glass is a single grain of sand, which represents the Milky Way galaxy that we live in. And so what's different about it is that I had someone drill a hole into this grain of sand. So I don't know if you can see it, but there's, a, there's just this little tiny... Uh, white dot in the midst of that little grain of sand. So most of the exoplanets that we found have been found within that little teeny tiny area of our galaxy. And most of these planets up until recently have been really, really big because we don't have the technology to see things that are smaller. Um, we found a few things uh, beyond this little hole since, since I've drilled in, <laughs> uh, but still most of them are, are within this little area. 
And for you guys, uh, you're wondering how did how in the world did they drill a hole into the grain of sand? Uh, they actually used a carbide drill bit, an actual drill bit that, that was that was that small. And they could have used a uh, a larger drill or a smaller drill bit, but I didn't want to have to have like an electron microscope uh, at my installations for them, <laughs> for people to see it. So that's uh, they they use these drill bits to make really really tiny instruments that can. Uh, basically uh, be sensitive to wavelengths and so they usually uh, cut into metal like gold soft metals like gold and other soft metals like that and I walked in there with this uh, this grain of sand and I said can you drill a hole into this and the guy kind of looked at me and he was like I don't know and then the guy next to him said oh yes that looks like fun and so uh, it was, it was kind of fun to be able to have them do that this next one also deals with uh, finding planets around other stars. Uh, but this is a video installation. So what I have going on here, I'm just going to turn off the sound of that other one, is uh, I have a really bright projector and a really dim projector. And the really bright projector is about waist level and straight on, and then I have another projector that's way at an angle and really high. And so what happens is when people come to this, all they see is this sort of uh, red and yellow pixely screen, but someone invariably wants to do shadow puppets, and they they can't help themselves and so they go out there and they start to play in this and then they realize that they can see more of the uh, uh, they can see something that's inside of their shadow and uh, the, the screen is really big so they can only see a tiny bit of what is actually there and so they kind of are forced to go out and find uh, uh, more people to block out more of it and, and over time they, they start to see planets and atmospheres and we're looking for evidence of water and so I have uh, images of water in, in the background and so this is the type of thing that we'll, we'll take to various, uh, I've, I've shown it at art museums, shown it at uh, events, music festivals and it's a lot of fun to see the way in which people interact with this and, and to me I love this world of seeing the unseen, the things that are that are there, that are right, you know, that, that we should be able to see but we we can't see because we either don't have the right mindset or we don't have the right technology. And I think this uh, this sort of analogy works on lots of different levels, uh, whether it's politics or it's it's science. Um, so this has been a lot of fun to put together. So um, a lot of what I do, I, I I like to call sneaking up on learning. So you know, there's a lot of ways that you can learn, and uh, people sit you down and say you are you are going to learn something now or you go to some museum and you see a sign that you know tells you what you're going to learn and what I like to do is is create things that are um, uh, that are really engaging that are beautiful that are mysterious that you're not exactly sure what they are but you're drawn to them and you want to learn and so once you once you want to understand then I think your uh, your, your mind is maybe a little bit more ready to uh, to learn things that maybe other ways uh, your, your mind might shut off once you realize that you're going to learn. So I, I kind of like this little phrase of sneaking up on learning. Uh, at JPL I do a lot of different things. Sometimes I get to do art installations. Uh, other times I help create um, uh, facilities around here. And one facility uh, we call Left Field. And Left Field is a place where we actually brainstorm uh, future missions to either go to other planets or to look at stars or galaxies or, or to create new robots. And um, uh, the word left field here is, is um, actually made out of uh, recycled styrofoam computer uh, packaging. And so I thought that was kind of fun. And the idea is that this room is, is supposed to be a lot of fun. It's a place where uh, no ideas are bad ideas, where uh, you're supposed to come up with lots of different ideas and um, quickly, rapidly prototype uh, the types of things that you're thinking about. 
and so we spent a lot of time sort of uh, trying to create the right atmosphere in this place. Actually, uh, these thrusters are. Uh, what can you see here? These thrusters are uh, little uh, oh spaghetti things. It's been fun. Different people working with different things here. Uh, this is another uh, facility called the Mechanical Design Center. And this big sign kind of shows uh, mechanical drawings from past uh, spaceships. And uh, this, is, um, this is a place that they, they actually design. Uh, so the place before left field is more about the big concepts of, of what, what we might do and uh, before we actually get to do it. And then this is once we've, we've been given the task to do something, say land on Mars, and now they actually have to physically design every single little part. And so there's a wall here, a bunch of really interesting parts. Uh, this one over here, if you can see my cursor, um, sort of round with all these triangles, that's one piece of aluminum that's maybe, uh, I'm going to say, this thick, uh, so it's maybe an inch, a few centimeters thick. And uh, all those little lines going across are, are milled out of one piece. So it's not a whole bunch of little pieces. It's one piece so that it can be a nice and strong piece, uh, yet still have the flexibility to do the different uh, things that it's supposed to do. So we have kind of a little uh, wall of uh, show and tell. And then uh, you kind of go into this room, and it doesn't really look like any other place at JPL. Uh, there, there are various uh, touch screens where they can kind of uh, hopefully help their design process. Kind of a fun place to hang out. Lots of toys in this place as well. And uh, what I like, uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, we went out to a, uh, a storage facility and they had this, this piece. And this was with the last rovers that went to Mars. They had airbags and it was it, um, the, the rover was kind of wrapped in this tetrahedral. And this was the base plate for this tetrahedral, and uh, we ended up making uh, making a table out of it. So beautiful little table there, unusual. So I like to try to find things that are that are meaningful to the location and uh, and make them into something that's integral to uh, to what they're doing there. So. Um, Sometimes I get to play with fun materials, and a lot of you guys may have heard of aerogel. Aerogel is really interesting. It's 99.8% air, and um, it has a lot of uh, amazing properties to it. And so what happens is they, they take uh, uh, some chemicals, and they uh, liquid chemicals, and they put them together, and it sets uh, just like jello, so it kind of jiggles, and then you stick it into a superheater, and... Uh, uh, all that's left after all the liquid evaporates is this really interesting, uh, let's see, do I have that picture? I don't, ah, I forgot the picture. Uh, really interesting uh, lattice that looks a lot like a sponge on a microscopic level, but it allows it to do a lot of really amazing things. And so one uh, that I'll actually show you in a minute is, is uh, being able to protect yourself from a, a, a blowtorch. Um, and JPL ended up using it to capture dust from a comet, which is pretty crazy. And so uh, what, what happened was that we had different levels of density. And so uh, uh, the one level was low density, then there was a medium density, and then there was a high density. And so what happened is as a comet flew past, we took a spaceship and, and uh, flew across its tail and uh, put out this big tray, and these little pieces would embed themselves in it. And uh, when we brought it back to Earth, we could actually see where these pieces embedded themselves. So the aerogel worked out really well with that. And on the, um, the rovers, the twin rovers that uh, have been on Mars for the past uh, years, um, there's aerogel kind of protecting its, its um, uh, instruments inside from getting too hot. But uh, now, hey, Joby, you want to come out here? Want to kind of demo something here? See if I can do this with my... Everyone say, uh, say hi to Joby. Joby's going to come down here. Our old Vanna White. So uh, first, maybe I'll, I'll just kind of show them what this looks like. So just so you... 
hopefully I won't drop it here. So this is this is the aerogel. It's really translucent. And it's really, really fragile. And these pieces sort of, uh, if you touch it too much, they'll break off. So Joby needs to get his hand really dry because the uh, the uh, just a little bit of liquid on your hand will will destroy the uh, the aerogel. So see, so is this in the right spot? So let's bring it down a little bit. And uh, I happen to have this uh, blowtorch here. So let's see. I wonder if it's better to do it back here, just so that uh, we can get the flame. Here we go. <laughs> so, so <laughs> yeah, bring your hand over here. Okay. And then if you uh, put your finger right over the top of it, it feels really hot because it is hot. <laughs> but it protected them. So let's try it again. Let's tr bring it back here just so that they can actually see the full. I'm going to take my headphone off here. Bring it down just so we can see the real torch. <laughs> Thank you, Joby. <laughs> There, hopefully you're able to see that pretty well. Yeah. Okay. So um, that stuff is a lot of fun. And so uh, I went down there one day, and uh, I asked them uh, at the request of a friend of mine, he said, well, what if you projected on it Project using a, a projector? And so this is, uh, I'll show you here, this is our first little test here. And it looked fabulous. It was really bizarre. It was uh, it was sort of like uh, taking a laser pointer and looking at fog. And these pieces are really really huge. Uh, they're and they're it's hard to show on my screen here. There we go. And they're really big, uh, larger than a piece of paper. And, and for aerogel, most of the time you only see little tiny chunks. So these were huge. And so I ended up um, making uh, an installation that. Um, where I had a sheet of glass, and on top of that sheet of glass, I had a whole bunch of different pieces of aerogel. And underneath of the sheet of glass, I had a projector that bounced up at like a 45 degree angle. And um, what happened here was that uh, there's sort of a person that walks on to the stage, the stage meaning the pieces of aerogel, and then you kind of zoom in to the person's head. And uh, the idea is that all this stuff behind this head is sort of their dreams. The dreams of people that, that sort of work here at JPL. And there you can kind of see on the right. Wait a minute. What was fun to do is uh, to go into the museum after, um, after hours and look at the, uh, I had this big acrylic case around it so no one would touch it and you would see all these nose prints all over it, <laughs> which was really funny to see because everyone was trying to look at the aerogel. So another aspect of things that that's, um, has been really fun is that uh, we build a, a number of different kinds of robots here and this one is actually part of a competition that uh, some people are in. It's a competition to make a robot that can do a whole bunch of different things. It's supposed to uh, climb a ladder, it's supposed to open a door, it's supposed to drive a buggy, which is really crazy. Um, but the idea is that this is a robot that's supposed to come and help you, save you in an emergency. And so they came to us, at first I think they just came to us because they wanted a pretty picture. They wanted us to make it look cool. But we actually care about making things that are, that are meaningful and like how, how can you uh, make a robot that, that is, um, 
is not going to scare you to death <laughs> when it comes to save you after an emergency. And so we, uh, we first, first thing we did was we actually made a full-scale mock-up, and sometimes the, uh, the mock-ups get a little out of control. Uh, this is Daniel. Daniel is, um, is actually an architecture student at a place called SciArc uh, here in, in uh, L.A., and he's, uh, he's been with us for um, a few months, and so he built this really beautiful model just so we could get a, a sense of scale because when you, when you see, you know, these drawings on a computer, it's, it's one thing, but you just don't really understand how big it is or, you know, how it, how it works on a volumetric sense until you actually build it. So that was kind of the first phase. And then the second phase was we, we went out and we, we, uh, we actually have a fire department on the lab. Um, so we went down there and talked to them about uh, the types of things that they want in an emergency response robots. And then we started to do uh, research on the, the different, uh, they have this as a hazmat, um, oh, what do you call it, hazmat uh, fire truck. And then we started to kind of look at, uh, you know, what, what, what do other countries use and what are the color schemes that other countries use and, and what are various things that we can kind of play off of. And, um, and then we also looked at, like, the grill of a car. Because if you look at the grill of a car, they all have different sort of uh, uh, personalities to them, whether they're friendly or mean or, or, you know, scared or sad. And this was the robot that they were sort of uh, put together. And then we started to play with uh, color schemes and uh, how we can sort of help them identify different arm parts and so this was sort of the the final sketch that we kind of put together so so hopefully it has less of a uh, terminator I'm gonna come and kill you uh, look to it and something that's a little bit friendly but also gives you a sense that yes it's it's here uh, because it's part of emergency response uh, team and so hopefully we're gonna be more involved in these types of designs in the future so kind of going back to some of the art pieces, um, uh, this is called uh, Juno. Juno is a spacecraft. It, it, uh, it um, launched, uh, was it last summer, last August, uh, right before, uh, yeah, it was last August. And uh, this is a mission that's going to Jupiter, and it's going to pass by the Earth in, um, in October because it, it flew out past Mars, and then it's... Uh, going to come back by the Earth to use a, a gravity assist to fling it out to Jupiter. And when they were uh, first uh, just about to send this thing, uh, they started to ask about, well, what could we do to, uh, to put something on the spacecraft that, that isn't, you know, is, doesn't have to be there? And so got some people together and brainstormed, trying to think about the concepts of, of Jupiter. And we didn't really come up with any ideas, but uh, eventually uh, my friend sent me an email, and he said, you know, um, Galileo, Galileo discovered the moons of Jupiter. Um, Galileo is, uh, his bones are on display in Italy. And uh, actually in a few different places, uh, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Um, and he said, what if we got a piece of Galileo's bones uh, to put on the spacecraft? And we were trying to figure out, well, well, first off, I just thought that was really cool. Uh, I don't know if that's bad or good, but um, uh, we were trying to think about, well, how would we talk about this? You know, like, because um, what happens is, is uh, Jupiter or Juno is going to orbit Jupiter a, a bunch of times, and then it's going to fall into the planet. And so we thought about burying Galileo, but that doesn't sound very good, right? I mean, that sounds sort of morbid. And so uh, we started to think about its orbits. Well, he would actually become a moon of Jupiter. Well, that sounds a lot better, right? So it's a moon of Jupiter. And then, um, then he would become one with the planet because because when he falls, when uh, Juno falls into the planet, then it kind of gets burned up inside of there. And so, so this idea of Galileo becoming a moon of Jupiter is just really poetic. And, um, and uh, we got in contact with the University of Padua, which is where a Galileo taught. And they happened to have his vertebrae not exactly sure why they have his vertebrae because there's a uh, there's the Galileo Museum in Florence I think I think it's Florence um, that has his fingers so and apparently there's some uh, 
uh, personal collectors that have other parts. But anyways, I, I don't know how all that story works out. But anyways, they had his vertebrae, and uh, they were going to give us, they, they had done these CAT scans and figured out, like, the perfect place to kind of take a little uh, segment out. And, uh, and NASA actually approved it. I was, I was super excited about this. Um, but uh, we, we, uh, we have an instrument from the uh, Italian Space Agency. And there was someone there that just didn't want it to happen. And so, unfortunately, it didn't happen. Um, we thought maybe it was a religious type of thing. But um, I actually got in contact with um, that the Pope has a um, scientific advisor who's always an astronomer and got in contact with a former uh, ad uh, advisor to the Pope. And, and he was all excited about it. He, he actually said, you should just go do it anyways. But uh, um, because of politics, we, we you know, we just we didn't want to uh, ruffle any feathers, and so that didn't happen. Uh, but uh, I think the um, European Space Agency is is working on a mission that will go to Jupiter, and there's a possibility that uh, that they might uh, be able to do it because that person at uh, the Italian Space Agency might not be there at that point in time. So we'll see. But I still love. Let's see. Uh, here is I forgot to show these pictures. Uh, uh, here's his vertebrae. <laughs> you wanted to see that. Um, uh, in the meantime, I was working on another project, and this one is a, more of a, an installation, and it deals with um, the giant. There are giant uh, lightning storms on Jupiter, and so let's see. Oh, here's the um, here's the various orbits. So this is called uh, beneath the surface, and. Um, It's a, it's a big room, and it's full of fog, or it's full of a cloud. And when you um, walk in there, you hear thunder and lightning. And, um, but you don't see any lightning, but people love to take out their cell phones. And but I have lots of infrared lights that are underneath, and it turns out that your cell phone can see infrared light, or at least many cell phones can. And so the only way you can see the lightning in this particular installation is through your cell phone. So it kind of deals with uh, using instrumentation to see things that our eyes can't see. And we're also trying to get a sense of um, uh, the structure, the interior structure of the planet. And when you see this projection in real life, it, it's uh, really pretty amazing to see how uh, a, a thin sheet of light looks uh, through a cloud. And then again, the name of the mission is called Juno, and every once in a while you'll see the word Juno pop out. And just to give you a sense of how this thing works, is um, it's not using a fog machine that most people may be familiar with. Um, we use these, uh, it's, it's normal tap water that we use, and we use these things called ultrasonic misters. And an ultrasonic mister is a little piece of ceramic, and it vibrates really, really fast. And it vibrates so fast that it vaporizes the water into this beautiful, beautiful uh, little fog. And what's interesting about this is that it'll stay within that container um, unless you blow it out. And so uh, we have a bunch of computer-controlled fans. There's a friend of mine named Justin Geyer, and he did all the electronics. And uh, you can see, uh, oops, go back there. These are the uh, infrared lights. Uh, they're, they're security camera lights. So security cameras use uh, infrared so they can see you at night, uh, but you don't see their light. But if you have your cell phone out, you can see the light that they're shining on you. And then uh, we had a number of these trays, and if you uh, blow it around enough, after about 15 minutes, it fills up this entire room, and then you backlight it with, with, um, with a projector, giving it a sense that, of the, the red that's on Jupiter, the red and orange.
So one last thing I'll talk about here is um, uh, this was the um, the rocket that sent Juno uh, on its way, and uh, uh, about six eight months before uh, Juno launched, um, one of the main people on the mission who was the project manager. Uh, really well loved by everybody, and really an amazing person. Uh, he passed away, and he he was he was really young, and uh, he wasn't the kind of person that you would imagine would uh, would pass away because he was in shape, and and he was just you know, uh, one of those kinds of people that that you were shocked to hear about. And uh, a few um, a few weeks before we were supposed to uh, launch. I got a call and someone asked me if I would do some sort of memorial for him, and uh, and I said sure I'll do anything and and uh, uh, they said well it it, uh, it can't be any any bigger than this and it can't be any thicker than this really thin has to be really thin and it can only be made of aluminum and it can't have any color on them and it can't and it can't and it can and he gave me all these rules about things and I'm like wow what in the world am I going to do for this <laughs> and uh, I want to do something special um, I didn't want to just like engrave his face on something I want to do something that was uh, unique and and mainly do something that that his wife would um, would be proud to have and uh, I didn't know his wife and I felt a little um, a little nervous and so I uh, I, I called up uh, I called up his wife anyways because I, I wanted her to be involved in the process and so uh, it turned out that they, they both had a great sense of humor and they'd had a bunch of very um, oh what do you call them uh, very somber experiences before and um, we wanted to do something that was maybe not quite so somber it turns out that uh, he loved to go uh, take an RV uh, a I don't know if, if everyone has an RV, but uh, an RV is a big truck to drive around the countryside. And so um, we kind of used that as a, a launching point to kind of talk about him. So this is what we ended up making. So this is the RV that he actually had. And uh, there's a bunch of different parts on here that deal with his life. And so um, he was a soccer coach in the, in the bottom kind of center area. It says play soccer, and that's a bumper sticker that we have around the states. Uh, the palm tree is, is about um, uh, uh, Hawaii because he loved to go to Hawaii and uh, the alien, he loved aliens. The window happens to be the captain's symbol for our military and it's just it's sort of this H shape and um, near the license plate you can see a, a, he was an equestrian in, uh, in the military when he was there um, and then other parts that are all about his life. And so it's really special to be able to, this is actually on the spacecraft, uh, I was able to present uh, a duplicate to his wife and, um, and it was really meaningful to her and it's um, kind of amazing that it's, it's uh, in space right now. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, so that's my email address. Um, uh, Directed Play is my personal uh, website. I do a lot of projects outside of JPL as well. Uh, you might be interested in, as well as uh, the projects from JPL. Many of them are on, on that site. So. You're still muted, Daniela. Sorry, I was muted. Um, Thanks, Dan, for presenting your work. Uh, I know most of your projects are quite well known amongst artists and also scientists, but it's great to be able to hear from you all these details and the, the, the background of each project. We have a few questions. Actually, now we can open the panel discussion, and uh, Pamela uh, will also participate. Uh, she has, uh, she's a, um, she has a, she's a doctor in astronomy, so she knows uh, a lot about the scientific insight of your work. And uh, I'm just going to read a couple of questions from the uh, viewers. Uh, one from Michael Uberti. Uh, who asks, uh, does or will this go on tour? Where do we need to go to see these wonderful <laughs> exhibits? 
I think he was referring in particular to the last one. I see. Oh, the last one. Well, yeah. um, so that's a little complicated question at this moment. Um, I'm hoping to do that in New York this summer, and so at the New York Hall of Science, and uh, because it's it's going to be the time at which uh, the Juno spacecraft actually uh, passes by the Earth. It'll be the closest. Um, uh, closest position to the Earth that it'll ever be on, uh, I think it's October 9th, and so uh, hoping to work something out with them uh, for that to happen. So that's that's the next oppor opportunity, I think. So right now it's in my closet. So <laughs> it was it was at a museum for um, several months, and and then uh, uh, we didn't have things organized to get to another spot. So, um, but hopefully this summer it will be there. And one more question from Andrew Planet. Uh, I'm very pleased that after all that happened with Galileo and the church during his lifetime, that they were in agreement to have him partially buried at Jupiter. A fitting end. Pity about his modern detractors and some Italian scientists forbidding that happen. So I, I think that's... <laughs> yeah, what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> And, and for those of you out there who would like to uh, add your own questions or comments, you can do this on Twitter using the hashtag GAMASTROART, G-A-M-A-S-T-R-O-A-R-T. Uh, you can also leave comments on the YouTube or the event page that is associated with this, this event that we're doing this evening. In the background, you can see... Um there's that uh, the model of that uh, robot. It's called Robo Simeon. Just in case you were interested. So. Yeah, I, I have to say I'm really impressed with the way JPL has been um, embracing unusual ways to communicate science to the public and to engage non-PhDs in the process of doing things right. Uh, I know there's you, there's Doug Ellison who came to JPL via medical imaging and being a hobbyist space, space image processor. And uh, I'd love to hear how we're all currently facing sequestration problems. How safer are the out-of-the-box thinkers in the face of the current reorganization of funding? Um, everything is on the table. So uh, I think we're all, you know, we're all unsure of what's going to happen. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, that's sort of where it's at. So, uh, so a good portion of my funding comes from outreach-related things um, to the public, but then another portion of my funding comes from internal uh, projects. And so uh, uh, right now, right now, it uh, looks like a lot of our outreach-related things are going to be reorganized, and how that all plays out, um, we won't really know until October. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a very real chance that um, a lot of people may not get to continue doing what, what they're doing. And, and for those of you who don't know what, what I'm talking about, um, the President's most recent budget for fiscal year 14 uh, looks to consolidate all education in America underneath the Department of Education, the National Science Foundation for Education Research, and the Smithsonian Institutes for Public Outreach. And so currently the way things are funded is we have science communicators and educators working hand in hand with scientists in a variety of different departments and bureaus from NASA to the Department of Agriculture to DARPA to um, well Department of Energy and with this restructuring they are taking and zeroing the funding for projects including things like CosmoQuest um, as they look to reorganize education into one place science into one place and so all of us are kind of waiting with bated breath to see what our future holds and we're trying to find ways to keep going so um, it sounds like a lot of us are going to have to find creative solutions to do the creative projects that we work on. I'm actually interested in knowing a bit more about your collaboration with the scientists at NASA. Uh, that I would like to know whether uh, you uh, you collaborate on the projects uh, also in terms of um, the scientific content or if um, everybody works uh, independently the, 
uh, according to the departments. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, we all interact a lot, and uh, uh, I think that the, the scientists really enjoy and appreciate the things that I do, and, and I definitely enjoy and appreciate the things they do. And uh, every once in a while, I get to be a part of those left field studies where where they're actually imagining what they will do, and uh, and having someone like me or someone uh, from my team that there is, uh, I think they find that useful, and and that's what I'm really excited about is somehow be, being able not just to communicate what they're doing, but uh, but also helping you know shape what we do in the future. So uh, yeah, a lot of people uh, kind of. Um, uh, Hang out. They, the, our our studio is a much different space than most places at JPL, and, and I think people enjoy kind of coming up here and and just uh, uh, getting a breath of fresh air. I think, and so um, through that process, we try to see, you know, can we uh, can we get involved in the various things that they're working. On. Uh, there is also um, a question from Peter Lake. <laughs> asking what's the uh, wackiest idea you have ever had <laughs> <laughs> well Galileo well I guess that wasn't my idea but uh, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't good enough um, uh, well I mean we're, we're working on something now about sending some music to Jupiter and having it come back and um, and so it's. Uh, I think it, it could uh, be a really amazing project, and we'll see if it if it can work out. Um, uh, it's going to Ju Juno is going to orbit 33 times, and then fall into the planet. So it really orbits 33 and a third times, and so that's the speed of a record. And so we're uh, we're kind of imagining some crazy ideas uh, to work with that. Actually, talking about. Uh sound music and space exploration I I like to ask you if you know whether there are future missions from NASA uh, in order to capture the sounds of uh, Mars for example I know that there have been some uh, attempts to do so but the microphone somehow always failed or <laughs> uh, is, is there any future mission that will uh, finally capture the sound of uh, a Martian storm or uh, its atmosphere? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, we, we do um, have a mission that's called InSight, InSight and it's, uh, it's going to go to Mars in uh, a couple of years, and it will be looking for Mars quakes, uh, like earthquakes, but on Mars. And the idea is um, is really to understand the internal structure of the planet because if you have an earthquake and then you hear uh, the reverberation c coming back, you can get a sense of the uh, 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 the different structure, the interior structures of the planet. And um, I know the main scientist is interested in various things like this. Uh, whether or not he can get a microphone on, I'm, I'm not positive. So that's that's a, that's the only one going to Mars that I can imagine uh, anytime there's, soon. There's a rover still under development that will be launching in the next few years uh, if the current funding plans stay true. It's the the rover that came out of left field in December. It's a sample mission. Um, I'm I don't know if they'd put a microphone on it, but it is a heftier mission that will be wandering around. Okay. Um, do we have any more questions? Uh, uh, we don't at this time now. Okay. Well, um, Dan, thanks so much. I think we are a little bit over the time anyway, and um, uh, I think uh, we can wrap up uh, this event. It's it's been really a pleasure to have you uh, and talk about your work, and uh, I really hope we'll be able. to to organize this in the next uh, for the next GAM uh, Global Astronomy Month again. So um, thanks to to Dan and Pamela for your uh, wonderful uh, participation today, and to all the viewers from all around the world, uh, <laughs> either in the live or recorded events. So.
Thank so you. our next uh, Global Astronomy Month Astro Art event is tomorrow at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. London. Rotate the planet as needed to figure out your own time zone. And it's going to be a showing of the video Serene Universe by Martin Roos and William Zeitler. So I'd encourage you to join us for that. And all of these videos will be going up on the YouTube channel Astrosphere Vids. And uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>